So I'm going to talk about sci-fi in general. Um, of course, there isn't enough time to cover everything, so I've got to restrict myself. So first of all, I'm just going to talk about science fiction literature. I'm not going to go into film or television or games or anything like that. But of course, in the discussion, more than happy to talk about sci-fi films and television and all that stuff. But for, for brevity's sake, I thought I'll just stick to books here. And also, um, I can't possibly give an authoritative uh, account of all of science fiction literature, so it's going to be very subjective. I thought what I can talk about is myself. Uh, in fact, it's one of my favorite subjects, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about sci-fi and me. So let me tell you about my childhood. I grew up in a small town on the south coast of Ireland called Cove. Here it is. It's very picturesque when you're looking at it from a distance. But I have to say, growing up there in the 1970s and 1980s, there really wasn't a whole lot to do. Um, there, were, there was no World Wide Web at this point. It was frankly a bit boring. But there was one building in town that, that saved me. And that was this building here in the town square. This is the library. And it was inside the library Amongst, amongst the shelves of books that I was able to pass the time and find an escape. And it was here that I started reading the work, for example, of Isaac Asimov, a science fiction writer. And he's also a science writer. He's, he wrote a lot of books. And I think it might have even been a science book that got me into Isaac Asimov. I was a nerdy kid into science. And I remember there was a book in the library that was uh, essays and short stories. There'd be an essay about science followed by a short story about that was science fiction, and it would keep going like that. And it was by Isaac Asimov. And I enjoyed the science fiction stories as much as the science. So I started reading more of his books, books about galactic empires, books about uh, intelligent robots, um, detective stories, but set on other planets. And there was a real underpinning of science to these books, of hard science in Isaac Asimov's work. And I enjoyed it, so I started reading other science fiction books in the library. I found these books by Arthur C. Clarke, which are very similar in some ways to Isaac Asimov in the sense that they're very grounded in science and in the hard science. In fact, the two authors used to get mistaken for one another in terms of their work, and they formed an agreement, you know, um, Isaac Asimov would graciously, graciously accept the compliments about 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Arthur C. Clarke would graciously accept the compliments about uh, the Foundation series. Anyway, so these, these books, hard science, hard science fiction books, uh, I loved them. I was really getting into them, and there was plenty of them in the local library. And the other author that seemed to have plenty of books in the local library was Ray Bradbury. And this tended to be more short stories than full-length novels, and also it was different to the Isaac Asimov and R.C. Clarke in the sense that it wasn't so much grounded in the science. Like, you got the impression he didn't really care that much about how the science worked. It was more about atmosphere and stories and, and character. So these were kind of three big names in my formative years of, of reading sci-fi, and I kind of went through uh, the library reading all of the books by Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, and Ray Bradbury. Once I'd done that, I started to investigate other books that were science fiction in the library. I distinctly remember these books being in the library by Ursula K. Le Guin, The Left Hand of Darkness and The Dispossessed. And I read them and I really enjoyed them. Um, and they are terrific books. And these, again, different to the hard science fiction of something like Isaac Asimov, Mark C. Clarke, or you know, the, in, the questions of politics and gender starting to enter into the, the stories. Um, also, I remember there were two books by Alfred Bester, these two books, The Demolished Man and uh, Tiger Tiger, also called The Stars My Destination. And these were just wild. These were almost psychedelic. And and I mean, they were action packed, but they were also the, the writing style was, was action packed. It was kind of like reading um, the Hunter S. Thompson of, of science fiction. It was fear and loathing in, in outer space. So these were opening my mind to other kinds of science fiction. And uh, I also had my mind opened and maybe warped by reading the Philip K. Dick books that were in the library. And again, you got the impression he didn't really care that much about the technology or the science. It was all about the stuff happening inside people's heads, uh, questioning what reality is. At this point in my life, I hadn't yet done any drugs, but reading Philip K. Dick kind of gave me uh, a taste, I think, of what it would be like to do drugs. 
So these were also names that loomed large in my, my early science fiction readings, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, um, Alfred Bester, and Philip K. Dick. Then there were the one-offs in the library. Like I remember coming across this book by Frank Herbert called Dune and reading it and really enjoying it. And it was, uh, it was spaceships and sandworms, but also kind of mysticism and, and environmentalism even. And I remember having my tiny little mind blown by reading this book of short stories by Frederick Brown. Uh, they're kind of like typical Twilight Zone short stories with a twist in the tale. And I, I just love that. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of science fiction, I think uh, short stories can almost be the natural home for it because, you know, there's one idea explored fairly quickly and uh, short stories are really good for that. Um, I remember reading stories about the future. What would the world be like in the year 1999? Uh, like in Harry Harrison's Make Room, Make Room, a tale of overpopulation that we, we all had to look forward to. Uh, and I remember this book by uh, Walter M. Miller, Canticle for Leibowitz, which was kind of a book about the long now, civilizations rising and falling. Again, blew my my little mind as a as a youngster and maybe started a, an interest I have to this day in thinking long term. So this is kind of a spread of the science fiction books I read as a youngster, and I kept reading books after this throughout my life. I've read science fiction. I don't think it's that unusual to read science fiction. In fact, I think just about anybody who reads has probably read science fiction because everyone's probably read one of these books. Maybe they've read Brave New World or 1984, you know, some Kurt Vonnegut like Slaughterhouse-Five or Sirens of Titan, um, you know, the Margaret Atwood books like The Handmaid's Tale or the Kazuo Ishiguro uh, books. Um, now, a lot of the time, the authors of these books who are mainstream authors maybe wouldn't be happy about having their works classified as sci-fi or science fiction. Uh, the term maybe was uh, a little down market. So sometimes people will try to argue that these books are not science fiction, even though clearly, you know, the premise of every one of these books is, is science fictional. But it's almost like these books are too good to be science fiction. There's a little bit of uh, snobbishness. Um, Brian Aldous has a wonderful little poem, a little couplet to describe this um, attitude. He said, SF's no good, they cry till we're deaf. But this is good. Well, then it's not SF. Uh, and recently I found out that there's a term for these books by mainstream authors that cross over into science fiction, and these are called slipstream books. So I think everyone at some point has read a slipstream science fiction book that maybe has got them interested in diving further into science fiction. Now, the question I'm really skirting around here is what is sci-fi? I'm not sure I can answer that question. Um, Isaac Asimov had a definition. He said, it's that branch of literature which deals with the reaction of human beings to changes in science and technology. And I think that's a pretty good description of his books and the hard science fiction books of Arthur C. Clarke, but I don't think that necessarily describes some of the other authors I've mentioned. Um, so it, it feels a little narrow to me. Uh, Pamela Sargent famously said that uh, science fiction is the literature of ideas. Uh, and there is something to that. Like when I was talking about how uh, short stories feel like a natural home for sci-fi because you've got one idea and you explore it in, in a short story and you're done. But I always feel like that, that way of uh, phrasing science fiction as the literature of ideas almost leaves something unsaid. Like it's the literature of ideas as opposed to plot and characterization and all this other kind of stuff that happens in literature. And I always think, why not both? You know, why can't we have ideas and plot and characters and all the other good stuff? And also, ideas aren't unique to sci-fi, right? Every form of literature has to have some idea or there's no point writing the book. Every uh, crime novel has to have an idea behind it. So... I'm not sure if that's a great definition either. Maybe the best definition came from Damon Knight, who said sci-fi is what we point to when we say it. It's kind of, uh, I know it when I see it kind of thing. And I think there's something to that. Um, and anytime you come up with a definition of sci-fi, it's, it's always hard to draw hard lines between sci-fi and other adjacent genres like uh, fantasy. They're often spoken about together, sci-fi and fantasy. And I think I can 
I can tell the difference between sci-fi and fantasy, but I can't describe the difference. Like, uh, I don't think there is a hard line. Science fiction feels like it's looking towards the future, even when it isn't. Maybe the sci-fi story isn't actually set in the future, but it feels like it's looking to the future and asking what if. Whereas fantasy feels like it's looking to the past and asking what if. But again, fantasy isn't necessarily set in the past. Science fiction isn't necessarily set in the future. Uh, you could say, you know, oh, well, science fiction is based on science and fantasy is based on magic. But, you know, any any sci-fi book that features faster than light travel is effectively talking about magic, not science. So again, I don't think you can draw those hard lines. And there's other genres that are very adjacent and crossover with sci-fi and fantasy, like horror. You know, you get sci-fi, horror, fantasy, horror. What about any mainstream book that has magical realism to it? You could say that's a form of fantasy or science fiction. Ultimately, I think this question, what is sci-fi? I think it's a really interesting question if you're a publisher. And it's probably important for you to answer this question if you're a publisher. But if you're a reader, honestly, I don't think it's that important a question. And there's another question that comes on from this, which is what is sci-fi for? What's its, what's its purpose? Um, is it propaganda for science? Almost like the way Isaac Asimov is describing it. Um, and sometimes it has been used that way in the 1950s and 60s. It was almost like this uh, a way of getting people into science. And reading science fiction certainly influenced future careers in science. But that, that feels like a very limiting way to describe a whole field of literature. Is sci-fi for predicting the future? Uh, most sci-fi authors would say, no, no, no. Bray Bradbury said, I write science fiction not to predict the future, but to prevent it. Um, but there is always this element of trying to, you know, ask what if and play out the variables into the future. Um, Frederick Pohl said, a good science fiction story should be able to predict not the automobile, but the traffic jam, uh, which is kind of a nice way of looking at how it's not just prediction. Um, and maybe thinking about sci-fi as a literature of the future would obscure the fact that actually most science fiction tends to really be about today or the time it's published. It might be set in the future, but often it's dealing with uh, issues of the day. Ultimately, it's about the human condition. And really, so is every form of literature. So I don't think there's a good answer for this either. I don't think there's, a, there's an answer for, for the question, what is sci-fi for? that you could uh, put all science fiction into. Okay, so we're gonna avoid the philosophical questions. Let's get down to something a bit more straightforward. Let's have a history of science fiction, science fiction literature. Caveats again, this is gonna be very subjective, just, just like my history. And it's also gonna be a very Western view because I grew up in, in Ireland, a Western country. So where would I begin the history of science fiction? Because I could start with the myths and legends and religions of most cultures, which have some kind of science fiction or fantasy element to them, you know, Bible, work of fantasy. But if I want to start with uh, what I would think is the modern birth of the sci-fi novel, I think Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley's Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus could be said to be the first sci-fi novel and invents a whole bunch of tropes that we still use to this day. The mad scientist meddling with powers beyond their control. It's dealing with electricity. And I talked about how sci-fi, you know, is often about topics of the day. And this is when electricity is just coming on the scene. And there's all sorts of questions about the impact of electricity. And science fiction is a way of exploring this. And in a, talking about uh, reanimating the dead, also kind of talking about artificial intelligence. Um, it set the scene for a lot of what was to come. Later in the 19th century, in the 1860s and then the 1890s, we have these two giants of early science fiction. In France, we have Jules Verne, and he's writing books like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and From Earth to the Moon and Journey to the Center of the Earth, these adventure stories with uh, technology often at the center of them. And then in England, we have H.G. Wells, and he's creating entire genres from scratch. He writes The Time Machine, War of the Worlds, The Invisible Man, The Island of Dr. Moreau. And also, I mean, over in America, you've got Edgar Allan Poe, uh, mostly doing horror, but there's definitely sci-fi or fantasy aspects to what he's doing. Now, as we get into the 20th century, where really sci-fi really starts to boom, even though the term doesn't exist yet, 
is with the pulp fiction uh, in the like 1920s, 1930s. This is literally a uh, pulp paper that cheap books are written on. Um, they were cheap to print. They were cheap for the authors too, as in the authors did not get paid much. People were just churning out these stories. So there were pulp paperbacks and also magazines. And Hugo Gerns back here in the 1920s, uh, he was the editor of Amazing Stories. And he talked about scientification stories. That was kind of his uh, agenda. And then later in the 1930s, John W. Campbell uh, became the editor of Astounding Stories. And in 1937, he changed the name of it from Astounding Stories to Astounding Science Fiction. So this is when the, the term really comes to prominence. And he does have an agenda. He wants stories grounded in plausible science. He wants that hard kind of science. So what you have here effectively is, yes, the, the genre is getting this huge boost, but also you've got gatekeepers. You've got two uh, old white dude gatekeepers um, kind of deciding what gets published and what doesn't and setting the direction. What happens next, though, is that there are a lot of science fiction does get published, a lot of good science fiction gets published in what's known as the golden age of science fiction, in the 1940s and 1950s. And this, it turns out, is when authors like Isaac Asimov and Ray Bradbury and Heinlein are publishing. Those early books I was reading in the library, I didn't realize it at the time, but they were books from the golden age of science fiction. And this tended to be the, the hard science fiction. It's grounded in technology. It's grounded in science. Uh, there tends to be scientific explanations for everything in the books. It's all good stuff, it's all enjoyable, but there's an interesting swing of the pendulum in the 1960s and 70s. And this swing kind of comes from Europe, from the UK. Uh, and this is uh, known as the new wave. And that, that term was coined by Michael Moorcock in New Worlds magazine that he was editor of. And it's led by these authors like Brian Aldiss and J.G. And Ballard where they're less concerned with outer space and they're more concerned with inner space, the mind, language, drugs, the inner world. And it's some exciting stuff, quite different to the hard sci-fi that's come before. Like I say, it started in Europe, but then there was also this wave of it in America, broadening the scope of what sci-fi could be. You got less gatekeeping and you got more new voices. You got Ursula K. Le Guin, Samuel R. Delaney, uh, expanding what sci-fi could be. And that trend continued into the 1980s when you began to see the rise of authors like Octavia Butler, who to this day is a huge influence on Afrofuturism. So you're getting more and more voices. You're getting a wider scope of what science fiction could be. And I think that the last sort of big widening of sci-fi happened in the 1980s with William Gibson here, who practically invented from scratch the genre of, of cyberpunk. Um, if, if, you know, Mary Shelley was concerned with electricity, then by the 1980s, we're all concerned with computers and digital networks and technology. And the difference with cyberpunk is where, you know, an Asimov story or a Clark story might be talking about uh, someone in a position of power, a captain or an astronaut, and how technology impacts them. Cyberpunk's kind of looking at technology at the street level, when the street finds its own uses for things. Um, and that was expanded into, into other things as well. And after the 1980s, we start to get the new weird, right? We get people like Jeff Noon, China Mievel, Jeff Vandermeer writing stuff that's, you know, is it sci-fi? Is it fantasy? Who knows? Um, which brings us up to today. And today we have, I think, a fantastic range of writers writing a fantastic range of science fiction, like Anne Leckie with her Imperial Radix stories and N.K. Jameson with fantastic Broken Earth trilogy, Yoon Ha Lee writing Machineries of Empire, and Ted Chang with terrific short stories in his collections like uh, Exhalation. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the future we look back on now as a, a true golden age of science fiction, where it is wider, and there are more voices, and, and frankly, more interesting stories. Okay, so on the home stretch, I want to talk about the subjects of science fiction. Uh, the topics that sci-fi tends to cover. So I'm going to go through 10 topics of science fiction, list off uh, what the topic is and name a few books, and then choose one book to represent that topic. It's going to be a little tricky, but here we go. Planetary Romance. Okay, so Planetary Romance is a sci-fi story that's basically set on a single planet where the planet is almost like a character, the environment of the planet, the ecosystem of the planet. And this goes back a long way. The Edgar Rice 
Burroughs stories of John Carter of Mars with kind of early planetary romance and even spawned a little subgenre of a uh, sandal and planet. Um, uh, Brian Aldous did a terrific trilogy called the Heliconia series where the, the orbits of, of a star system, you know, are, are kind of the, the, the driving force behind the, the stories that take place over generations. Philip Jose Farmer did this fantastic series, the Riverworld series. Everyone in history is reincarnated on this one planet with a giant river spanning it. But if I had to pick one planetary romance to represent the genre, I'm going to go with the classic. I'm going to go with uh, Dune by Frank Herbert. It really is a terrific piece of work. All right. Space opera. Space opera, and the term was intended to denigrate it, but actually it's quite fitting. Space opera is what you think of when you think of sci-fi. It's intergalactic empires and space battles and good rip-roaring yarns. And you can trace it back to these early works by E.E. E. Doc Smith. It's the good old stuff. And space operas kind of fell out of favor for a while there, but I think started coming back in the last few decades. Like you got some really great hard sci-fi space opera by Alistair Reynolds, and more recently, Yoon Ha Lee with Nine Fox Gambit. All good stuff. But if I had to pick one space opera book to represent the genre, I'm going to go with Ancillary Justice by Anne Leckie. It is terrific. It's like taking Asimov and Clark and Ursula K. Le Guin and the best of all of them and putting them all into, into one series. Great stuff. Now, in space opera, generally, they come up with some way of being able to travel around the galaxy in a faster than light or warp speed or something like that, which, like I said, is kind of fantasy, really. If you accept that you can travel faster than light, then maybe you're going to write about generation starships. Um, this is where you accept that you can't zip around the galaxy, so you have to take your time getting from star system to star system, which means it's multiple generations. Uh, uh, Brian Aldous's first book was a generation starship book called Nonstop. But there's one book that I think is the last word on Generation Starships, and it's by Kim Stanley Robinson, and it is Aurora. Um, I love this book. Really great book. Um, definitely the best Generation Starship book there is. All right. What about writing about utopias? Funnily enough, not as many utopias as there are the counterpart. Um, maybe the most famous utopias in recent sci-fi is from Ian M. Banks with his Culture series. The Culture is... Uh, a socialist uh, uh, utopia in space, uh, post-scarcity. Um, and they're great space opera, galaxy-spanning stuff. What's interesting, though, is most of the stories are not about living in a utopia. Because if you're living in a post-scarcity utopia, it's frankly super boring. And all the stories are about the edge cases. And all the stories are about, it's literally called special circumstances. Um, all good fun. But last word on, on utopia and science fiction must go to Ursula Le Guin with the dispossessed. It's an anarcho-syndicalist utopia, or is it? Depends how you read it. You know, I know I definitely have some friends who read this like it was a manual, and other friends who re read it like it was a warning. Um, I think inside every utopia, there's a, there's a touch of dystopia, and dystopias are definitely the more common uh, topic for science fiction. It's maybe it's easier to ask, what's the worst that can happen? than to ask what's the best that can happen. Uh, and a lot of the slipstream books would be uh, based on dystopias, like Margaret Atwood's terrific The Handmaid's Tale. Um, and I remember being young and reading in that library, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, a book about burning books, terrific stuff. But I'm going to choose one. If I'm going to choose one dystopia, I think I have to go with the classic. It's never been beat. George Orwell's 1984. Last word in dystopias. It's it's a fantastic work, fantastic piece of, piece of literature. Um, I think George Orwell's 1984 is what got a lot of people into reading sci-fi. With me, it almost went the opposite. I was already reading sci-fi, but after reading 1984, I ended up going to read everything ever written by George Orwell, which I can highly recommend. Um, there's no sci-fi, but terrific writer. All right, here's another topic a post-apocalypse story. You also get pre-apocalypse stories, like, you know, there's a big asteroid coming or there's a black hole in the center of the earth or something and how we live out our last days. But generally, uh, authors tend to prefer post-apocalyptic -apocalypt settings, uh, whether that's uh, post-nuclear war, post-environmental uh, catastrophe, post-plague. Choose your disaster and then have a story set afterwards. Like J.G. Ballard, he writes stories about not enough water, too much water. 
Uh, and I think it's basically just he wants to find a reason to put his characters in large, empty spaces because that's what he enjoys writing about. Um, very different. You'd have the uh, post-apocalyptic stories of someone like John Wyndham, um, somewhat derided by Brian Aldous as cozy catastrophes. Well, yes, the world's ending, but we'll make it back home in time for tea. Uh, at the complete other extreme from that, you would have something like Cormac McCarthy's The Road, which is relentlessly grim uh, tale of post-apocalypse. Um, I almost picked Margaret Atwood's Oryx and, Cr Oryx and Crake trilogy uh, for the, the ultimate post-apocalyptic story, and it, it's really great stuff, post-plague, uh, genetically engineered plague, very timely, but actually even more timely, and a book that's really stayed with me is Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. Um, not just because the, the writing is terrific, and it is a plague book, so yes, timely, but it also tackles questions like, what is art for? What is the human condition all about? All right, another topic very popular amongst the techies, artificial intelligence, actual artificial intelligence, not what we in the tech world called artificial intelligence, which is a bunch of if-else statements. Um, stories of artificial intelligence, uh, also very popular in slipstream books from mainstream authors. Like recently, we had a book from Ian McEwan. We had a new book from Kazuo Ishikuro tackling this topic. But again, I'm going to go back to the classic, right back to my childhood. And I'll pick iRobot, a collection of short stories by Isaac Asimov, where he first raises this idea of three laws of robotics, uh, a word he coined, by the way, robotics, uh, from the Czech word robot. And he, these, these uh, three laws are almost like design principles for artificial intelligence. And all the subsequent works in this genre kind of push at those design principles. It's good stuff, not to be confused with the movie of the same name. Here's another topic, first contact with an alien species. Well, sometimes the first contact doesn't go well, and the Ur book on this is H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, and every other alien invasion book since then has kind of just been a reworking of War of the Worlds. It's, it's terrific stuff. Um, for more positive views on first contact stories, Arthur C. Clarke uh, dives into the books like Childhood End, Childhood's End, and in Rendezvous with Rama, what's interesting is we don't actually contact the alien civilization, but we have an artifact that we must decode and get information from. It's good stuff. More realistically, though, um, Solaris by Stanislav Lem is frustrating because it's realistic in the sense that we couldn't possibly understand an alien intelligence. And in the book, spoiler alert, we don't. Um, for realism set in the world of today, Carl Sagan's book, uh, Contact, is, is terrific. Um, well worth a read. The kind of really tries to answer what would a first contact situation look like today. But I got to pick one first contact story, and I am actually going to go with a short story, and it's uh, Stories of Your Life by Ted Chang. And I recommend getting the whole book and reading every short story in it because it's terrific. This is the short story that the film Arrival was based on, which is an amazing piece of work because I remember reading this fantastic short story and, and distinctly thinking, this is unfilmable. This could only exist in literature. And yet they did a great job with the, uh, with the movie, which bodes well for the movie of Dune, which is also being directed by Denis Villeneuve. All right, time travel as a topic. Um, I have to say, I think that uh, time travel is sometimes better handled in media like uh, TV and movies than it is in literature. That said, you've got the original time travel story. Again, H.G. Wells just made this stuff from scratch, and it really holds up. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good book. I mean, it's really more about... Um, class warfare than it is about time travel, but it's it's solid. Um, and actually, I highly recommend reading a nonfiction book called Time Travel by James Glick, where he looks at the history of time travel as a concept in both fiction and, and in, in physics. Um, you got some interesting concepts like Lauren Bukes's The Shining Girls, which has as its premise, time traveling serial killer which is a really interesting mashup of genres, right? You've got evidence showing up out of chronological sequence. By the way, this is being turned into a TV show as we speak, as is uh, The Peripheral by William Gibson, recent book by him, and uh, it's terrific. What I love about this, it is, it's a time travel story where the only thing that travels in time is information, but that's enough with today's technology. So it's, it's like a time travel for remote workers, 
Um, so again, very timely, as all of William Gibson's stuff tends to be. But if I got to choose one, I'm going to choose uh, Kindred by Octavia Butler um, because it's just such a terrific book. I mean, to be honest, the time travel aspect isn't the center of the story, but it's absolutely worth reading as a just a terrific, terrific piece of literature. Now, in time travel, you've generally got two kinds of time travel. You've got the closed loop time travel, which is kind of like a Greek tragedy. You try and change the past, but in trying to change it, you probably bring about the very thing you were trying to change, you know, the shining girls or something like that. Or you have uh, the multiverse version of time travel where uh, going back in time forks the universe. And that's what the peripheral is about. And that multiverse idea is explored in, a, in another subgenre, which is alternative mm -hmm. history, um, which kind of asks what if something different had happened in history and then plays out the what if from there. A counterfactuals, they're also known as. And I remember, you know, growing up and going through the shelves of that library and co, uh, coming across this book, a Transatlantic Tunnel, Hurrah by Harry Harrison, where it's set in a world where the American War of Independence failed. And now it's the modern day and the, the disgraced descendant of George Washington is in charge of building a transatlantic tunnel for the British Empire. And that tends to be the kind of premise that gets explored in alternative history is what if another side had won the war? There's a whole series of books set uh, uh, in a world where uh, the South won the Civil War in the United States. For my recommendation now, I'm going to go with The Man in the High Castle, which is asking what if the other side won the war? In this case, it's World War II. It's by Philip K. Dick. I mean, it's not my favorite Philip K. Dick book, but my favorite Philip K. Dick books are so unclassifiable, I wouldn't be able to put them under any one topic. And I have to get at least one Philip K. Dick book in here. Uh, final topic. And, oh, this is a bit of a cheat because it's not really a topic. It's a subgenre, cyberpunk. But as I said, cyberpunk deals with the topic of computers or networked computers more specifically. Um, and there's some good stuff like Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, uh, really ahead of its time, uh, definitely influenced a lot of people in tech. Like I know everyone I know that used to work in Linden Lab, the people who are making Second Life. Uh, when you joined, you were basically handed Snow Crash on your first day and told, this is what we're trying to build here. But if I got to pick one cyberpunk book, you can't beat the original. Uh, Neuromancer by William Gibson. Just terrific stuff. Um, and... What's interesting about cyberpunk is, yes, it's dealing with uh, the technology of uh, um, computers and networks, but it, it, it's also got this atmosphere, a kind of noir atmosphere that William Gibson basically created from scratch. And then a whole bunch of other genres spun off from that, asking, well, what if we could have a different atmosphere and explore stories like steampunk is kind of like, well, what if, what if the Victorians had computers and technology? What would that be like? And basically, if there's a time in history that you like the aesthetic of, there's probably a subgenre ending in the word punk that describes that aesthetic. Um, and you can go to conventions and you can have your anime and your manga and your books and your games uh, set in these kind of uh, uh, subgenres. And they are generally, like I say, about aesthetics with the possible exception of solar punk, which is what Steph is going to talk about. But I am going to finish with these books as my recommendations kind of for um, a broad range of topics of science fiction from 50 years of reading science fiction. And I think about, you know, if I could go back and uh, talk to my younger self in, in, in that town on the south coast of Ireland about the world of today, I'm sure it would sound like a science fictional world. By the way, I wouldn't go back in time to talk to my younger self because I've read enough time travel stories to know that that never ends well. But still, I mean, here we are living in the future. I mean, this past year with a global pandemic, that is literally straight out of, you know, a bunch of science fiction books. But also just the discoveries and advancements we've made are science fictional. Like when I was growing up and, and reading science books in that library, uh, we didn't know if there were any planets outside our own solar system. We didn't know if exoplanets even existed. Now we know that most solar systems have their own planets. We're discovering them every day. It's become commonplace. We have sequenced the human genome, which is a remarkable achievement for a species. And we have the World Wide Web, this, uh, this world-spanning network of information that you can access 
uh, with computers in your pockets. Um, amazing stuff. But of all these advancements by our species, if I had to pick the one that I think is in some ways the most science fictional, the most far-fetched idea, I would pick the library. If libraries didn't exist and you tried to make them today, I don't think you could succeed. You'd, you'd be laughed out of the venture capital room. Like, how is that supposed to work? It sounds absolutely ridiculous. A place where people can go and read books and take those books home with them without paying for them. Uh, it's It sounds almost too altruistic to exist. Uh, but Ray Bradbury, for example, I know he he grew up in the library. He said, I discovered me in the library. I went to find me in the library. And he was a big fan of libraries. He said, reading is at the center of our lives. The library is our brain. Without the library, you have no civilization. He said, without libraries, what have we? We have no past and no future. So to end this, I'm not going to end with a, a call to read lots of sci-fi. I'm just going to end with a call to read full stop and read fiction, you know, not just nonfiction, read fiction. It's a way of uh, expanding your empathy and defend your local library. Use your local library. Don't get, let your local library get closed down. We, we are living in the future by having libraries. Libraries are science fictional. And with that, thank you.